I'm Trisha, and um, today we're going to talk about Draft Board Alley and the people associated. Um, it's a photography inspired workshop, so there will be lots of images that we can look at together. And um, I'm quite excited to share my findings. Um, so yeah, let's let's crack on. So there. Yeah. All right, so connecting the past to the present, a photographic journey. This presentation provides a snapshot of a mixed race community who lived in Canning Town, London, during the late 19th and early 20th century, locally known as Draftboard Alley because of the black and white people that lived there together. This presentation is actually based on a resource that I've created for New Heritage Month. Um, if you're interested, you can drop me a line later, you can get a copy of this. Um, so the resource, is available free of charge. You can also get it, um, you can also download it as well from the Newman website. Right, so let's move in on. Okay, so a little bit about myself. My name is Tricia McCauley. I'm a commercially trained photographer and tutor. I'm the former director and program coordinator at Rosetta Arts for over 11 years. Um, I'm currently the curator at the Humble Gallery and I also work in the school. I mentor young ladies in an East London school. Okay, let's move on to the website. Okay, we'll also have Hajir Dahiru that will be joining us. She's a photography teacher, design and technology teacher and an artist. And she's also the founder of I Am A Photographer Collective, a new and based photography group. So what we're gonna learn in this session, we're gonna learn quite a bit. We're gonna have lots of informal discussions. Um, I, I really want it to be interactive. So please give me your feedback. If you know a lot about local history, please do interject. Um, this is my journey looking at Draft Board Alley. Um, so I'm very happy to hear you know, your stories as well. So during this session, you will gain an insight into the mixed race community who lived in Kennington gain a basic introduction on how to analyze photographs, discuss, analyze archival images together. So we will look at certain images, we will um, talk about them, we'll have um, <coughs> you know, informal discussion. And also we'll look at a selection of photographic images that were inspired by this project. Um, some members of the I Am Photographer group um, used the resource and created some photographic responses um, to, to the images. Um, so yeah, so we'll look at that and, and we'll take, move on from there. Um, just on a quick note, does any, do we have any local people? How many people live in Canning Town? Please unmute yourself and shout out if you do. I can't see you by the way. So, but if you could, anyone on the, online would like to say if they're from Canning Town or if they know a little bit about the local history, that would be great. I am. Hey, anyone else like to share? Greg, you, Greg, where do you live? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm in, I live in Cannon Town. Oh! I've been here for the last 40 years. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I do as well. Great. Right. That's a long time. I mean, I have... Thank you. Thank Links you. with Canning Town is that um, I went to Rosetta, but I, I didn't really know much about the history. And I also lived in Beckton many years ago, and I loved the docks. I used to go cycle around there. You know, I took pictures when I was doing my photography course at the time. I took pictures of Tatum and I building of the Royal Docks. But I, I hadn't come across this draft board alley until recently. And this is what piqued my interest. And I thought, like, oh, and I started looking more and more into it. And it's like going down a rabbit hole. I found personally, it was like going down a rabbit hole because the more you look, the more information mm -hmm. uh, I found. So I'm just gonna give a brief history of Canning Town for those who are not familiar with the area. Um, so Canning Town had been largely undeveloped marshland for centuries. It was only accessible by boats or toll bridge. However, when Barking Road was built, it opened up the landscape and a booming industry expanded and transformed Canning Town into a heavily industrialized and densely populated area. So with this, it attracted lots of workers from around the world um, came to Canning Town to work because there's a booming industry in shipping, pharmaceuticals and manufacturing. Okay, so we're just gonna set the scene. I think it's important to have a little context. And I found a really interesting link um, to a soundbite on the BBC. And it's just a linked uh, recording 
talking about uh, Draft Called Ali and some of the challenges that they had. Um, I'm just going to play about two minutes. Um, so basically the recording is quite low. So you just, um, if you could just mute yourself um, and then we can have a listen. Bearing, uh, <laughs> As this was a community, as very mixed, there would have been men from the Caribbean, sailors from Somalia, India, West Africa, China. So a very diverse population. Draft Board Alley was kind of reference to its uh, largely racial makeup in terms of black and white people living essentially cheek by jail. The unrest that broke out in 1917 seemed to focus around black lodging houses and that these lodging houses were run by black men themselves and they were buying up properties. If you look at electoral rolls, you can see some of the men who appeared in, in the newspaper reports, some of the black men who appeared in the newspaper reports actually own properties or at least they're registered as, as, uh, as part of the electorate. So they were established people, maybe some white elements uh, resented this. You kind of have to ask yourself, you know, perhaps some of these white men who were challenging the right of black men to go out with white women or own their own houses in the area, why those men weren't in fact doing their bit for the war. And in fact, in, in a, in a post-war disturbance in 1919, which seemed to involve some of the same individuals, uh, whether, uh, and in fact, the magistrate questioned the, the, the white protagonists and said, you know, so many of these black people have come to fight for the empire. They've done their bit. They've served on board ships during the war. You know, they've put their lives in danger. Whereas many of the people attacking them were, <laughs> I guess, local, <laughs> local ne'er-do-wells who, who would have, you know, given any excuse to have a fight. Okay, so we're going to just stop there. So what did uh, everyone think about that little um, context? Uh, I couldn't really hear it properly. Yeah, it's unfortunate because um, it's the BBC and I thought the sound quality would be better. Oh. But I do recommend, um, if you want a copy of this, I've got the links in this presentation. You can right. check it out yourselves. It's a really interesting snippet. It, it sounded, yeah. But what I can pick up was something interesting. Yes, yeah. I've yeah. just typed I mean, it. Just sets the scene. Oh, <clears throat> Sorry, I've just put a really short summary of a couple of facts in the chat function in case you couldn't hear. Oh, thank you. Hey, can I say something? Yes, you may. Yeah, I just, what I've heard, it was very interesting. I didn't even know that sort of thing went on. I suppose one can't know everything. Yeah. I found it very yeah. interesting and um, just shows you learn something new every day. And I've learned something this morning. Thank oh, you. that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. We're not even halfway through the session. I know, this is just <laughs> new to me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so we're going to... So just, let me go. I think it explains a lot of Cadden Town's racism that it was... It's been there a long time because you know it's it's, it's historically a highly racist area, mm. especially in the seventies, eighties. But it's interesting because some of the you know this group of people were there in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. So some of those you know, some of their ancestors still exist in Canning Town. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's really and that's what I was so fascinated about because I know I thought. You know, our presence, black presence, didn't really get into Caddy Town until you know during the Windrush area. Um, so I was quite surprised to find out about this community and the sort of work that they did. And um, that's that's why I thought, you know, I have to tell this story. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. And one of the pioneering um, leaders of this community was a man called Camel Chunchi. Um, he was a significant community leader and activist. Um, he was born in Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka, um, and he joined the British Army and served in France, Greece and Malta. So when he came to England, he actually um, changed his religion. He became a Christian. He married a local lady called Mabel William Tappan in 1919. And um, he was the minister of Wesleyan Methodist Church, Missionary Society. 
And he founded the Coloured Men's Institute, which was located at the Tidal Basin Road. So we're going to analyse this image together in a little while, um, but I just want to give you a bit more background of the work that Kamal did. So we'll go back to that image. Okay, so this is the space that, so it, originally it was actually a Chinese lodging house. And unfortunately in the cellars, it was used as an opium den. Um, but when Kamal um, sort of like took over the space, he renovated it into a community space. And it was a, it was a much needed space because the black and Asian men really needed a safe space to, you know, to meet each other, to get support. Um, some of them were quite destitute and um, Kamal would provide, you know, food and clothing. So it's a really important space. Right, so this is um, Tidal Basin Road today. Um, so unfortunately, the building was demolished in 1930 in the road widening scheme. And Camel, bless him, he continued running the CMI, but it was difficult, but he ran it mainly from the Presbyterian Church Hall in Canning Town. He lost a lot of funding as well, um, but he was so passionate about helping the community. He toured the UK to raise funds, to buy food and clothes, he organised lots of events and trips for this community, for, for all the community, you know, not just black and um, Asian men, it was for all community um, within Draftwood Alley, really. He's a real activist. But unfortunately, um, Kamal really was, was the Coloured Men's Institute. When he, when he passed away in 1953, the Institute closed because there was no more funding. His poor wife couldn't carry on by herself. Um, but he, you know, he was like a major player and he had, he supported that community with all his life, all his life and all his heart, really. Right, so today, do we have any photographers in the audience? I can't see anybody, so I don't know if I recognise, I can't recognise anyone. Do we have any photographers in the, in the uh, workshop? Are you saying anyone who takes pictures on their iPhone? Because I do. Is that what you <laughs> That's still photography. That's still I, photography. I, I'm Anyone else? A photographer, not, not professional. No, no, but you have an enthusiasm for it, do you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is, is there anyone else? I'm sure there must be a few out there. Um, yeah, I, well, I take some pictures which get featured in Noom Voices. So, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And um, Maggie Felshaw has just written in chat. She's a photographer. Oh, wait. Um, Welcome, Maggie. Maggie um, actually helped support me a lot in this uh, project by photographing some of the locations. And you'll see, uh, as we go through this presentation, some of her work as well. So thanks, Maggie. I can't see you, by the way, but it's wonderful to know that you're here. OK. Um, Chani? Shen yeah, Shanida. That's me. Oh, hi, Shanida. Welcome. Shanida's yeah. another member that helped me as well. So welcome. Yes. Great. Great. All right, so I'm gonna talk about how do we analyze a photograph? So there's a very simple tool and it's called observe, think and wonder. So a photograph is a great source of historical information. When we read a photograph, it's a very strange thing if you're not a photographer really to think about reading a photograph because generally we just look at it, but we can actually read photographs. And when we carefully extract information that can often be overlooked by just a glance. So when we look at images, we actually have to break them down into different parts and different elements. And then that's how we read and extract information from it. So for example, um, the first starting point would be observe. What do you actually see when you look at an image? What's in the image? You would want to identify the elements and describe what is in the image. Think, what do you think of this image? What connections can you make? How can you interpret some of the symbols? What do you infer by looking at these photographs? And wonder, what do you wonder about these images? What questions do you have? And I just want to talk a little bit about myself, actually. When I was a little kid, um, I remember looking at pictures. Um, we had lots of photo albums, family albums at home. My dad was interested in photography and film. And I remember I was obsessed with these old photo albums and I would sit there and I'll look at them and I wonder who are these people? You know, why are these images so small? And you know, I'll ask my mum. And, and actually that is a form of reading an image, you know, asking questions, looking at them, observing them. Um, 
So I just wanted to share that with you. So we all can actually read an image. It's just about having those tools to be able to do it and to talk about it critically. So I'm just going to move on. To so this is the image we're going to use for the OTW. Observe, think and wonder. So guys, I'd, I'd love you to try and join in with this. Um, so some of you can unmute yourselves and feel free to shout out because it's, I don't want to be talking all the time. I want, to be, I want it to be more interactive. So please feel free to join in and don't be shy. So what do we have here? What, do we, what sort of image do we have here on show? Does anyone want to? Yeah, so my yeah. Nubian London's um, um, put their hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and say something? Hi. Yeah, one of Hello. the first things I noticed is that there are females in the photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes when you go back, females aren't always held as important long lines men. So it's nice to see the females there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, what I noticed in this image as well is like, they're representing the community. So you have English guys, white English guys, we've got black guy, we've got Asian, we have Chinese. Um, so that is another element. But what, what could that actually mean? Is that representing Draft Board Alley? Is it representing a wider world? Uh -huh. Hello? I'm sorry. Um, I, what I've seen when I looked at it first, that with that gentleman sort of easing back, it's like, to me, it's like it's the first time this has been what we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. And he seems a bit, you know, amazed, you know. And um, and I just think it's wonderful because um, whatever's coming out of it, the sound, we don't know what it's saying. It's yeah. obviously very intriguing to them with that gentleman with a big smile on his face. Mm -hmm. I think it might be in the, the start of whatever went on, yes. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful point because this is Camel himself. And literally mm. this is, uh, he's starting to, he's gonna open a clinic actually to help purge the, the opium dens. And so this is him in the centre here and he's smiling quite broadly. And, you know, he's kind of, it seems like he's surrounded by his assistants, which could be his community, you see. This is my interpretation. There's no, one thing I must say, there's no wrong or there's no right in, look, when you're reading the image, it's, it's all about interpretation. I had, um, I had, I noticed that, I thought that the newspapers were interesting because it's like they're there to show that these people are cultured and that they um, are literate. And yet in the, in the photo, because it's posed, neither of the people with newspapers are actually looking at the newspapers. Exactly. <laughs> they're just like um, props to indicate that this is a cultured group yeah. of people. Well, it does seem positive in the end, even though it's a prop, it's coming along it's, in a positive this is light. Like, this is absolutely wonderful because also the gramophone, yeah. why is the gramophone though there? Of course, the gramophone at the time would have represented, and you know, the average person may look at that and be quite shocked to see these people, you know, so well-dressed, so well-presented, um, looking, you know, surrounded by a gramophone. But on, whoops. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So, yeah, so, but also we can look a little bit deeper with this image because um, you may not be able to see it too, too well, but the lady that's actually sitting with the newspaper, the heading is called Joyful News. And then it kind of connects a little bit with the gramophone. What is the joyful news? Is the joyful news about this new community? Is it about this new center that's here? And also what I found quite interesting is actually, if we look at the guy holding the newspaper, with the, he's got quite a stern look on his face. And I know at that time, actually, a lot of newspapers demonized this community. They demonized you know, men of color, if you like. So maybe for me, he's having like a protective stance and he's holding up this newspaper. He's not actually, to me, he's not actually reading it. He's like holding it up, but is it like some sort of barrier? Um, but, but that's my interpretation. And if you zoom in and look at the image even closer, it's not, you can't really see it too well on here, but there's some stories in there that involves ships and boats and docks. So I'm gonna do a little bit more research. So I'm quite intrigued to see what that newspaper, um, what, what the um, stories were in that newspaper at the time. So has anyone else got any more thoughts on yeah. this? So interesting to me, that, that gentleman with the newspaper and the way he's looking, Mm. It, it's telling me, I'm looking behind his eyes, it's saying to me, we've arrived, it's here, mm. you know, with all what's going on. He's actually saying something with his pose. 
and yeah. his eyes. I like to look at people's eyes and his eyes tells a lot mm. yeah. to me. I have to say I was really drawn to his face the first thing I saw in that in the photograph. And yeah, yeah there's that saying if um if eyes could, you know, if, what is it that people's um, souls through their eyes or something like through, that? Through their so eyes, you can tell that's true. You can tell so much mm. from that gaze. There's really a lot going on yeah. there, that yeah. gentleman. Absolutely. I'm thinking maybe he's thinking this is all for all a farce, you know, why are the photographers here, you know, you know, I mean, I'm thinking maybe he, he's not buying it. <laughs> he's not buying it, is he? So, um, uh, and Neandra, but yeah, Neandra, I love that image. Neandra has raised her hand. Neandra, would you like to say something? Okay. Yeah, hi. Sorry, I think I think it's interesting that um, they're all wearing like their like smart clothes, like the guys doing their ties, mm. and you know everyone's so smartly dressed. Even though it probably looks like it may might have been like a radio show, but so people couldn't be able to see the, what they're looking like, but they still wanted to kind of look presentable and look like they're dressed, and you know yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, it is very interesting. Frederick in chat says um, the man staring seems to be on his guard. I think that's yeah, it's good. Absolutely, point. that's what I, I agree. With. I agree with you there. Definitely, it's kind of like saying this is our community as well. We don't because they had a lot of violence in that community. So I think he's like he's very guarded. He wants to protect his community. That could be what he's saying, you know. But yes, all right. Thank you for that. I'm going to move on. So we've got a lot, quite a few more images to have a look at. Uh, let's go. So another one of my favourite images here. Trisha, was could you um could you turn your McKay. camera off? Now, I'll just... Sorry to interrupt, Trisha. I just think your internet's oh, struggling a bit. Much better, thank you. Is that better? Yeah, that's is much that better? better. Thanks. Okay, all right. So next we have was Claude McKay. Uh, he was a political writer, poet, born in Jamaica in 1889. Now he wasn't really a resident of Canning Town, but he did a lot of work with lo London dock workers and he interviewed um, dock workers um, in the area as well. Um, he worked for the socialist publication Dreadnought alongside Sylvia Pankhurst, the suffragette, and she spoke at the public hall in Barking Road in Canning Town. Um, and also while interviewing these uh, London dock workers, it later inspired them a couple of his books, um, Home to Harlem and Banjo. He didn't spend many years in Britain because he came. Dis he was disillusioned with Britain after a while, and he went on to America. But there's some really some interesting portraits of him. We go to that one. So there's some portraits of uh, Claude. What elements do you think make a great port great portrait uh, photograph? Anyone like to comment? Give them a second. I reckon people have got some comments. I, I thought, do they have to be black and white? <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they don't have to be. Is it posture? Yes, posture is a good one. Lighting. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, lighting. And it's like um, capture the feeling of the, I mean, capture the express of the person, character. That's what I guess. Yeah. That's right, exactly. I think it's and it has to tell a story as well. It tells something about the sitter. Sorry. Oh, it's confidence as well. Mm. It, it, it shows me confidence because he's standing there and people are actually going to be listening to what he has to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this picture here where he's standing, it, I, I included it, although it wasn't from Canning Town, but as a young man, he spoke at the Kremlin in Russia. How amazing is that? This guy from Jamaica came to England and moved mm. on, to, you know, he, he traveled the world. And um, how much confidence would that take for a young person to speak at the Kremlin? Um, Lucy in chat has said candid portraits are best. What do you mean by that, Lucy? Um, I prefer it when they're not posed and you can really see what, like you can see an element of what a person was actually like. Mm. Yeah, that's good as well. Because yeah, some of the, especially in the nine, you know, in the thirties and forties, they're heavily posed. And if we go back earlier, for example, in the early days of photography, ultimately most of them were posed because I don't know, with photography in those times, um, the shutter speeds, which is the time that, which is where the camera opens up its lens was very, very slow. So you had to stand sometimes for at least 
I don't know, it could be like two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. So that's why when you look at images going back, you know, early, early days of photography, everyone is just very posed and static. Um, and then with the onvent of smaller cameras, that's when we could, get, we could do more um, spontaneous photography and capture those candid moments. But yeah, I love that point. That's a really excellent point. Thank you. Okay, so this is actually, this is my favorite image of Claude. It's him of a young man, but also the point of this resource is actually, I want people to do their own research. I want people to be inspired by these archival images. And um, there's a great photograph here by Sylvie um, of this young man. And I think she's really captured the essence of this photograph. It's beautiful. I feel it's a really beautiful image. And I, I don't know Sylvie's hair, but you know, that's a wonderful image and I really do like it. And also she hasn't just completely copied that image. She's created her own style. And that's what we need to remember when it comes to photography. You can be inspired by images, but also it's about creating your own style and your own identity. Any comments on this image at all? Tricia, can you try having your camera back on again? We'll see how we get on. It's so lovely to see your face <laughs> when you're talking. <laughs> I'm so sorry to interrupt that's fine, everyone. That's fine. Trisha's internet was a bit unstable this morning, so um, that's why I asked her to turn well, it off briefly. But, yeah. but we'll try again and have it on. All I can say is that I just really like seeing the two images side by side together. It, mm. This speaks to um, images and people and s stories through through the ages, really. Um, yeah. And definitely feeling of connections. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's wonderful. It's a wonderful image. Thank you. Oh, so we go back. Sorry. So there's some more images, but you know, we can bring colour. We don't have to do just black and white. And this is a, quite a nice um, contemporary image here of a young man. But um, what do you notice about the style of these portraits? What's the underlying mm -hmm. theme? That seems to go Your face in the side. Absolutely, exactly, exactly. And I think um, in the forties, this was this was like the artist gaze. You know, they're gazing off. You know, they're looking at somebody outside of that frame, or they're kind of gazing and thinking maybe they're going to write their next book. You know, that was kind of the style. And also, if you look at the the um, images from film stills from uh, uh, film stars, they always had kind of this long gaze, um, which I find quite. Interesting. I used to um, have that a lot in my work. I actually prefer profile shots. I don't know why, but I think these days, you know, everything's like full on, isn't it? It's full on and uh, with these selfies and stuff. But um, yeah, so that was an underlying theme really for images of him. Okay. So we're just going to move on to a different topic now. I'm going to introduce you to the Laskers. Now, the word Lasker is not something we would use today. Um, but it was a term that was given to them by, you know, local people. Um, and they were seafarers from the Indian subcontinent and they were employed on British ships to replace British sailors who abandoned their posts. They worked mainly as cooks, machine cleaners, coal carriers, stoked coal in up to 40 degrees heat. Now, I just want to share this with you. Basically, when they were employed on the British ships, the, um, they, the captains had this notion because you know, these men were from hot countries, they would be able to take the heat, you know, they would be able to be able to withstand that 40 degree heat because they should have been, they should be used to it because they, they come from hot countries. I just found that, you know, a little bit amusing. Um, but unfortunately, so we had the Laskers Club actually, and that was founded in 1909 by Kay Chowdhury. And it was located near Victoria Docks, making an ideal stopping point for Laskers in London. And between January and June, so between January to June 1910, um, 4,180 Laskers made use of that club. And it was located at 313 Victoria Dock Road. And can you imagine between 1890 to 1920, 1920, there was, the Laskers formed at least 20% of the British workforce. So um, did anyone familiar with, with them? No? 
No, first time to hear of it. Yeah, yeah. And there's a really interesting story. So I'm going to share a link with you. Um, it's by Asif Shakur, and he talks about his grandfather who came um, over in the early, in the late 19th century. So let me just click on this link. Okay, so there's a lovely story here. You go onto the new and unlocked website. There's lots of stories on here of individuals. Um, but this, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I recommend you check this out in your own time. There's a story about his grandfather who was born in 1895 and then he came to he came to the UK and he actually worked on the Royal Albert Docks and he kind of documents his grandfather's story with images and some paperwork and some maps really lovely story so if you do have time I recommend you checking out that I'll site. pop the, um, it's very I'll interesting. Pop the link into chat Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, let me go back to connection. Right. Okay, unfortunately, they were treated appallingly. Um, to be quite fair, the British sailors, many of them jumped ship. And when the Alaskas, um, they came on board the ships as well, many of them jumped because they were, they were fed the worst food um, they were fed rotten food. They didn't have much in terms of health care. Um, and when they got to England, some of them were abandoned by their employers. They were left stranded without pay. Um, and you can see here that I've got a, a news article documenting the sailors. And uh, yeah, they were really poorly treated, unfortunately. And, um, but some of them stayed here, married local women, but unfortunately they were referred to as Lasca Sally or Calcutta Louise by local people. Um, Tricia, just really quickly, Frederic, um, who I'm guessing from the name is French, um, I, just said in chat that Laska is a French slang. Ah, could um, Frederic, do you know, know what it it means in French? Uh, yes, Laska is, of course, and indeed a very pejorative uh, pejorative term in French. Um, it, it, it's basically just someone who lives uh, with uh, hot jobs here and there, and someone that we tend not to trust. So I'm actually wondering why uh, the adjective has been attributed to this, work, uh, this workforce, because apparently, I mean, obviously they were not doing bad things, but helping the British society. So I'll be interested either way to talk further with Prisha or do research on my on my side, because mm. it's interesting the connotation that from one context to another and from one country to another, it changes. Absolutely. That's fantastic. That's a really interesting really. point and um, I like uh, it yeah. is still the negative uh, image. Mm. Yeah. Just but, um, so I was just going to say, with, as what the lady just said, what's that got to do with France? This was here in England. I don't see why. It's a French word. That's no, I'm not talking about the word. Sorry, I'm talking about how they made that referred to it mm -hmm. as that. Who is interested in that here in England? I don't think anyone wanted to but know that a, time. There is always a connection. So okay. I appreciate your comment. Mm. But the comment was that actually I was making, not diverting the history, but actually also some words are used by other communities and countries. And it is a French word. And I was trying, I made a comment because I was trying to see how it traveled and ended up in England and be used as well. Yeah, it's really helpful. And um, Fr Frederica, I think it, there's no doubt that it was because it was the docks and there were lots exactly. of people coming through. Can I pass over to Mark Gorman, who's a local historian and has his hand raised? Hi, uh, thanks. That's a really interesting discussion. I think I think the orig origin of the word is actually from the subcontinent. I think it's Persian in origin, and it meant something like army or soldiers. And obviously, it's been a, it's a loan word that's gone into many languages and has acquired a pejorative negative view. But I think its original meaning was not negative. Mm, thank that's you. fantastic. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, Mark. 
Thank you for that. I think there's a lot more research we can all do with this project. Interesting. All right, let's so go to the next slide. Okay, so just a little bit more of um, visual now. You know, I, first thing I see is that the, the guys in the picture are so young. Um, and also what I notice is that the guy in the center is drinking a cup of tea. You know, I'm wondering if that's, if, was that intentional? Was he just happening to be drinking a cup of tea when the photographer came along? Or does it signify something else? You know, what is the favorite drink of the British people? It's tea. Where does tea come from? It's from China and India. So I'm thinking maybe, you know, the connotations there. Um, but yeah, what I would like to ask if, if you could interview these men, what questions would you ask them? Would anyone like to comment? No? I'd like to know how old they are. Yes. I mean, the one drinking the tea looks like he's only 14 years old. I mean, the questions I would ask is that, why did you come here? How, how did that happen? What sort of contracts were you given? Did you leave your family? You know, why did you want to leave your family? So I would love to know the background story of these individuals and why they came here. What were they promised? Did they get some Someone of them? Has um, their hand raised, my newbie in London. Yeah. yeah, I think I would ask what their first impression of England was. And if that was the same impression that they received while in their home country. Mm. When my dad came here, he expected it to be one way. And when he arrived, it was completely different to what he expected and much worse mm. than like, just imagery, what he saw. He expected gold on the street and he saw factories and smoke and pollution. So I'd ask them what they expected to see and what they actually saw. That's a good point. That's a good point. And a, and a lot of the workers that were promised, you know, money when they got here, some of them were abandoned by the ships. So they were left destitute. Um, so again, this is a really interesting story that we could, we could, or I could potentially follow up. Okay, I'm just gonna to move to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the servicemen at the colored, it's called the Coloured Men's Social Club. So this club wasn't actually in Canning Town. It was in the, in the West End at the YMCA. But I think it's very important because some of these men would have resided in Canning Town. And I really love this picture. I just think it's amazing. And I always also think, so I, say, I wonder what the British public at that time thought to see all these, these guys lined up, you know. Um, so it's a really lovely picture. But we're not going to analyse this one. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. So I'm just going to go to the next slide. So this is the image that I really enjoy looking at. So please do unmute yourselves or put your um, answers in the chat. What can we see here? What is this image telling us? Well, I can see that they really enjoy themselves, the fellows with the cigarettes, playing that game, whatever it mm -hmm. is. It looks like dominoes. Yeah, that's, I was trying to work out. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to work out what it was. Really, it looks like really Domino's. Absolutely, and they feel they feel relaxed. Yeah. They feel like you know. I, I guess for them, it's like a sense of home. Um, but what I notice, you know, which I'm intrigued about, is like you see the t the women in the background as well, um, and I'm intrigued about their story. How did they get here? What sort of role did they play? Um, it was hard for black and Asian men to be here, but what was it like to be a woman as well in this environment? Interestingly, so, um, um, I think sorry, sorry, Greg, to interrupt. Um, Maggie's just put in chat that actually relating to the last photo, but perhaps read relevant as well about um, how the women in the photo looked almost out of place, which is similar to what you were just saying. It's unusual yeah. to see women in the photo of people relaxing and mm. having fun. Exactly. So, and why, why do you think the soldiers attended these clubs? Does anyone want to take a guess? Well, they need to socialise, isn't it? To keep one's sanity. You need to see other people mm -hmm. to interact. Yeah, I think that's yeah. what it was, yeah. And, and I think they probably were unwelcome in local pubs. You know, you can imagine it, can't you? Going into your local pub, you probably ended up in lots of fights. So they needed a safe space, you know, to relax and forget about their worries and, um, you know, and. 
and they had their own spaces and that's why they had to create their own spaces. Can I just say, think, sorry, I was going to hmm. say the gentleman with the, the one in the middle of the cigarette, he seemed to, as that other gentleman said, Greg, he probably had a good hand. He seemed quite pleased with himself when he makes his <laughs> He seems quite, yeah, he seems he's, quite, he's you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he does. He does, doesn't he? He seems quite smug. He seems no, quite look, smug. Looking, looking more at the women, mm. it seems as though they've got something around their neck, something they are carrying. It's mm. women. Maybe it's cigarettes and sweets and things. Interesting. Right. Yeah, I'm going to do some more research, though, about the women. Well-dressed, they're well-dressed. Mm, they are. They are. So how do we think the British public responded to this image? Can you imagine, you know, in the early 19th century, opening up the newspaper? Well, do, you, do you think it was a positive response or a negative response or just one of surprise? Yeah, more like shock. Just, yeah. You know. Mark, what would you like to say? You've raised your hand. Uh, I, uh, just a really interesting point. I hadn't noticed that those women were had um, had um, uh, strings around their necks with uh, then they're mm -hmm. carrying boxes. I, I wouldn't wouldn't they probably be charity workers selling sort of little flags? You remember flag mm -hmm. days where people used to sell sort of pin on paper flags, and I wonder if it's that's what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah could be. I'm going to try and do some more research on them and, and find out what their role is actually. So maybe that could be another workshop. We shall see. <laughs> okay, let me just move on to the next. Frederica says in chat that she lived in Harlem in New York for many years and that there was a club, uh, I guess, that reminds her of these photos in her area. And it was just a fantastic place to hang out. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next one. Another great... I mean, they just look like they're just chilling, aren't they? They're just relaxing. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's good to see these images, isn't it? And this all happened in the UK. This is happening, you know, London and Canning Town. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about it until, you know, the last six months, like six months ago. We've moved up from pipe, from cigarettes to pipes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're smoking pipes now. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful image. It's and great. we don't huddle around that fire. Mm, where's <laughs> Kyle? But it's true. It is true. Okay, thank you. Marriages. There are plenty of marriages, folks. Um, I'm just going to read this quote because I do find it funny. So um, anyway, we've been married for years and I find the British coloured man, I don't say all, but I say most, make us very good husbands. Is there anyone in the group that can vouch for that comment, uh, for that quote? Yes. No? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true because they're human, so obviously, you know, they make them very um, happy. Good yeah. husbands, yeah. Yeah. It depends on the quality and, and of the person. That's good. Absolutely. It's all about the quality. And if you remember, I know the um, soundbite was very low, but if you remember that the, um, the lecturer, he said that a lot of the men were actually, they were well not well paid, but they, they worked, um, they came from, you know, after the war. So some of them had money, some of them bought houses. So some of them were quite entrepreneurial as well. So I'd imagine that's quite attractive as well. Um, however, this image of the couple here, they don't look too happy at this point. Uh... It was cold, man. Look, he's got his clothes in his hand. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> oh, gosh. Let me move on. Okay, there's another another image here. This is actually a Somalian. Um, uh, yeah, I think the green was Somalian, um, but it's a great image. It's a wonderful image here. Yeah. Nice. Sorry. So moving on to my favourite part is I call it the Canning Town Kids. I, I really want to read this quote for you because I think it gives you a good context of the time. Although we had lots of um, disturbances and you know lots of negative things going on, there was there was still a lot of good things going on, and I think the kids do represent that. So there's a quote from Doris. So she was a white East Ender who was born in 1922 in Canning Town, and she lived there until 1948. And this is her thoughts as a child. There were lots of black kids. We used to play together. No animosity between any of us. There were white women, married black, you know, West Indians. They were working on the boats and they got on ever so well together. 
We played in the street, great big skipping rope right across the road. And we had a factory down the street. So we used to have quite a bit of traffic. Just drop the rope and let the lorry go over it. Everybody in the street used to speak to each other and all the children used to play together. So that's a really lovely, I think it's such a lovely quote amongst the background, backdrop of, you know, all these um, problems. There was a real sense of community. Um, let me just go to the next slide because it's bigger. So there's a real sense of community here. And when I look at this image, I think, oh, you know, I just want to give them a big cuddle and some ice cream. Um, but also it's quite important to see that there was a significant um, amount of mixed race um, children that lived here and grew up in Canning Town, you know, well before the wind, wind rush era. Mm -hmm. um, so please do share your comments. I don't want to... Leonie has just talk. said, um, she's just asked whatever became of these people. Good question. And, and I will address that in a sec, but there's some lovely images on another website. So I thought we could uh, take a quick peek at those and uh, we'll get back and discuss um, what you just asked. So if you go to, if you get time, you go to Hidden Histories. Mark Gorman's just pointed out that from that photo, you can tell that some of the children unfortunately had rickets. I oh, guess really? they had... Oh. Well, I get, don't know if you can go back to the image quickly just to see. I think maybe they had yeah. some bandages on their legs. They look like socks. I thought they were socks. Yeah. Uh, if you, if think, you look Mark? at the boy on the right with uh, uh, with the shawl around him, look oh, at his yeah. knees and his and his uh, his lower legs. That's it that's didn't, didn't look too good. Right, right. That's, and several of the kids have got the same. The kid on the left, the boy on the hmm. left. I suspect that's Ricketts. Yeah, it's not surprising because you know they were quite poor. You know, poverty was quite high then, um, so they didn't get a decent diet and stuff. So. Um, yeah, but, bless them. Bless but them. those two at the end seem poor and proud. These two at the end, the bigger boys, they oh, were very, kids? yeah, mm. they look very, yes. Yeah. Not that the others aren't, but they, he sort of stood out, the one at the very end, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an endearing picture. Yeah. Well, I just want to quickly show you some other images. You can check it out. Can I just say something about this image, if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah sure. It's, it's interesting how you say, you know, it's such a nice image of them all playing together because, um, I wonder, is that just one-sided experience? Because growing up in the very racist Tower Hamlets, and my partner mm. growing up in a very racist Canyon Town, yes, mm. we did all play together, black, white, a few yeah. Asian that were there, but the experience, as a white person would tell it, was one of bliss, because they were never subject to their own mm -hmm. racism. Whereas now, as an adult, when I talk to some of those children I grew up with, they yeah. idolised those moments, and there was no racism. Mm. I was there. I lived the racism. So did mm. my sister. And mm. so seeing this image to me doesn't bring back, oh, look how we all played together. Yeah. Although that's there, I'm aware of, there were no doubt some nasty things said as well. Now, I'm not putting that on this image because mm. everybody's different, but Canning Town was highly racist. Mm. And so I can't look back at the image with just bliss and remove mm. racism from it because that would be very suspect to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. But at the time, he seems to have just captured an essence of happiness. But yeah, you know, behind the back, the back story. I, I mean, I grew up in the 80s in Essex. So I know, you know, we had, I experienced that as well. But yeah, sometimes you had a great times and other days it was awful. Sometimes you wanted yeah. to go down the road and there's a group of boys and you think, oh, what, you know, they're going to call out or shout at me today or not. Do you know what I mean? It was always like yeah. that. But when we Canning Town was particularly heightened for its mm. racism, though. I mean, it was really excessive. Yeah, yeah. Very sad. Very sad. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, thanks for sharing that. It was really interesting. Okay, so just, I just wanted to show a few more of the community, of the young people that lived in the area. And again, I'm intrigued what, you know, what happened to them. For example, we have tea parties so going back to camel he, he he had a lot of um parties and workshops for this community and as you can see them here so there he is sitting there at the front i think that's why he was so passionate and he really tried to you know make the best of what they had at least give the children some good memories as well. So yeah, so I just thought I wanted to share that link to you if you wanted to check it out. 
Okay, um, so I'm just going to move on to the next image. Just to let you know, Tricia, that Hadji is right. here. Hadji is here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, Jack Leslie, do we have any footballers? Do we have any footballers in the in the in the workshop in the room? Definitely not. No, I'm not. A, I'm not a footballer, but I um, wrote a, a article about Jack Leslie for Newman. Oh, Boys. did you? Yeah. Well, we need we need to talk. You need to put your email in the chat for me. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so again, Jack Leslie, just going through the research, I came across him. Um, so he was born on the 17th of August in 1901. Uh, he lived at Gerard Road. Um, he was baptised on the 29th of September in Gabriel's Church, Wellington Street. Uh, he was a great footballer. He played for Barking Town. And then later on, he joined um, Plymouth Argyle in 1921. He played for them for like 14 seasons. And out of 133 goals, um, sorry, out of 100, yeah, out of 133 league goals in, in 384 games. So he was the fourth highest goal scorer. Let me click on here. So, so this is uh, the area, um, some images that were taken by Maggie Falshaw. Um, so this is the area where he was where he was brought up. The actual road doesn't exist. What happened is they rebuilt the area. Um, but in 1925, Leslie was called to represent England. So I guess at this time, we have to remember there was no TV and people didn't read the newspaper so much from certain parts of the country, I guess. But however, he was dropped from the team by the selection committee. I think that's the FA when they found out he was black. So actually he was a great football, but they didn't realize he was black. Um, which is quite interesting. And um, this is a quote from Jack himself. He says, I did hear that the FA had come to have another look at me, not at my football, but at my face. They asked and they found they'd made a ricket, found out about me daddy, and that was it. No one ever told me officially, but that had to be the reason. So the so the reason why he didn't get to represent his country is because he was black. But funny enough, they didn't realize. Um, but I find that quite intriguing because I, I would have thought that would have been the first thing um, they would have known about him. But yeah, that's interesting. Any comments on that? Not necessarily um, assume that, you know, he, he wasn't black. So here's black. another image of Jack. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry? I was going to say, not necessarily that they would have known that was him because he, the skills he had, they only thought it pertaining to one section of society. Only, I think that's what it could have been. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any comments on this image? I was just wondering not on the, what the... the not, not on the image, but the story about what happened to him is very reminiscent of Walter Tull, who used to play for Clapton Football Club and right. then went on to play for Tottenham. Yeah. And then he was uh, called up in the First World War and he was mm -hmm. clearly a leader amongst men and was given a field command and appointed an officer, which wasn't supposed to happen to black people. Right. And tragically, he died in the war, so he never returned to England. But that was an echo mm -hmm. of that. But he must have been absolutely outstanding because the people in the field made him an officer, which was unheard of then in the mm -hmm. British Army for an officer to be commanded, and it wasn't a coloured battalion, it was a with white troops, so that was unknown. So it's really interesting to see the links between football and, and, and race, and then the British Army. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Leandra has her hand raised? Yeah, I just wanted to continue what Dean said. Um, he played for Clapton CF, well, Clapton FC at the time. Mm -hmm. He's now CFC. And um, I've also written another article about him, which is going to be in the May issue of New Voices, um, okay. because they're actually, um, they've actually, all the kind of people together um, uh, made him a, a blue plaque, which they placed in the old Spotted Dog uh, ground where they were based. And they've right. also done a banner of him as well. So when it, they open up the ground again, they're going to mm -hmm. put the, um, the plaque that, that um, they did for him over there as well. So his story is really interesting. I mean, both their stories, both mm -hmm. Walter and Jack Leslie's stories are really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. And so, as, it, as I mentioned throughout this presentation, all, all this was happening in Canny Town. You know, it's just 
for me, I had no idea and I just find it fascinating. Um, so this is an image of Jack. This bit I found, you know, is a little bit poignant, I guess. In 1965, he was offered the job as a boot boy at West Ham United. So he was clean, he cleaned the boots of the likes of Trevor Brooks and Harry Redknapp. Um, at 80 years old, his retirement was featured on ITV's The Big Match program. Um, Jack Leslie died on the 25th of November, aged 88. And it wasn't until after his death, in, you know, recently, next last year, um, there was the Jack Leslie campaign um, was set to raise 100,000 to fund the statue to be, to be built outside Home Park, Plymouth. And in August, the target was achieved just after six weeks. So at least now, I guess, although it's quite sad, you know, he's getting his recognition long overdue. Um, but yeah, so that, that's my thoughts on that, really. I just thought he's a bit... I don't know, I don't want to use the word sad, but, you know, just a bit to cleaning boots. You know, he was a major footballer. He achieved a lot and he just didn't get that recognition. Yeah, I, I found that very demeaning, you know. I mean, he wanted to do it, but I just thought to be mm. doing that from what he was before, mm. that shouldn't be the end. That shouldn't be the ending at all. But I suppose his love of football, he was happy yeah. to do that, but... No. Apparently, um, boot boys were normally the kind of up and coming want to be footballers. So they were often, often the, like the youngest people in the team well, and the ones that wanted to join the squad. And so it's quite unusual yeah. to have an elderly gentleman with such an esteemed <laughs> career to come and clean yeah. the boots of people like, you know, Harry Redknapp. And, you know, he should have been the one that was being, have his boots being clean. you know, having That's his right. moment in the spotlight. Yeah. 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 yeah but, okay. All right, so uh, again, we have a photograph by Sylvie, um, inspired by this image here. Um, so it's a wonderful image. Just moving on quickly. So I'm just going to talk about Josie Woods. Does anyone, has anyone heard of Josie at all? Just out I of interest? Heard, but it was again, mm -hmm. um, as the previous football player, both of them I heard from the Newham Voice newspaper. Okay. Um, I hadn't hadn't heard of her, but she was like the, I guess the UK version of I guess kind of Josephine Baker if anyone's familiar with her. Um, so she was a local lady. Um, she lived in Ivy Road in East 16. Her father was from Dominica, and her mother was a local gypsy. Oh, sorry, not a local. Was a local woman of gypsy ancestry. Um, she was quite talented. Um, when I was reading some of the notes, I said that she was always moving around and she didn't keep still. So I guess that's what led her to her dance career. Um, at 14 years old, Josie joined a dance group called the Magnolia Blossoms and they left the UK to dance in Paris. So she spent a number of years dancing in Paris. She uh, appeared in films, um, uh, for example, the Kentucky Minstrels and the Nitwits. I mean, the, I watched the films, they're not, you know, it's minstrels, so they're not great but it's history and it's in context of the time. Um, but the, yeah, the, the film is, the Kentucky Minstrels is available. You can get that on the BFI um, website. Anyway, on her return to London, Josie joined the Eight Black Streets, which is one of um, the first of the black British dance troops. And she told the music halls around the UK. She was a pioneer actually of the jitterbug dance in Britain. So pictures of uh, Josie Woods. However, um, on the Newham Heritage website, someone had researched and managed to get in contact with her son. Um, and there's some beautiful portraits of her and some further details about the work that she did. So I'm click off some of these links. So like if I scroll down here, you'll see, you know, a typical 1920s style image. Beautiful young lady. So she was also a teacher and a choreographer, and she inspired um, a new generation of dancers. And she was also featured in the BBC, doc BBC Two documentary called uh, for Black Britain. I did try and search for that Black Britain documentary, but I, I just couldn't find it, even though I went on their website. Um, I couldn't actually find the film. And here we have her hair as well. So again, I recommend you checking that out. It's a really interesting story on Josie there. 
Um, also, that uh, story about Josie Wood's research by East End Women's Museum mm -hmm. um, is part of Heritage Month. There's a trail that you can walk around Canning Town that takes in a few wonderful women of Newham. So um, when you go on our website, you'll see that link to go on the uh, self-guided walking tour of Canning Town to see some of the places connected to their stories. Thank you for that, Rosie. Okay, what have we got next? Sorry, can I just jump in? Um, sure. Because um, a museum is going to be opened, um, it's going to be dedicated to East End women, and that's mm. going to be opened in Barking. I do believe it might be next year. Right. And um, she's going to be featured in there as well. So, yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Well, that's wonderful. That's really good news. I'll um, make a note and uh, look out for that when it opens. Okay, so we're um, talking about our ancestors and heritage. Now, who still has a family album? Who kind of prints out their digital pictures and puts them in the album? Does anyone still do that? I do. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Because it's a dying, it's a dying thing now, isn't it? Oh, oh, Hajir, are you here? Do you want to make a comment about um, family albums at all? Hi, everyone. Hello. Yes. Uh, Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Hi, hi, everyone. Well, hi. family album. Uh, I I think it's a dying breed. But to be honest with you, I am one of the fan who is really fighting to get people to start printing their work photographs and putting them in somewhere, whether it's a family album or it's a family box photo album, whatever it is. But because we are not going back, when you lose your phone, you probably don't go back to check the other pictures that you lost unless you have them in our cloud, you don't even go there. But I think family album is a good idea to start bringing it back in a way to keep us a record because without that record, we wouldn't be able to see all these photographs. Yeah, thank you, Hashia. So, uh, and also they like artwork in itself. Um, they are, they yeah. are, they and are. And a place also, for both. Yeah, and also right. some people think family album has to be a photograph. Sometimes it's a photograph of something important. So, for example, if you have a family oh, jewelry that you always grow up with, you can take a Hello. picture and put it there. Um, I think she's frozen out no, there. Tr so, um, Trisha, I'll continue. Trisha, um, it's actually, I think it might be you mm -hmm. who's freezing um, because we, I think we could all oh. continue to hear her. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know if your internet's maybe struggling a little bit, but we heard what yeah. Hajir was saying. Oh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's strange. Okay. Thank you for that, Hajir. Um, so in the resource, if you do have time, maybe we can go back and explore some of the family album. Uh, there's an activity in the resource and um, it's just nice to print out some of those images. I think there's a place for digital because, you know, in terms of archives, digital images are brilliant because they don't decay. Um, you know, you can't really, well, you can lose them, but in terms of holding on, to um, the images is better because they're not going to decay, you're not going to lose them as such. Um, but there's always a place to print them out and share them with family and friends, start conversations. So I think there's a place for both of them. And I mean, my, personally myself, I remember I've got loads of images on, of my kids on phones that I've just lost, you know, that's gone forever. Um, so yeah, try and print these images out. And you can do things like create photo books now, you can just um, do that online. Okay. Right, so what happened to this community? You know, where did all these people go? Did they just suddenly, you know, all move out? What, what happened to them? Um, so it's a question I was asking myself. Um, yeah, so some of the men actually returned home because of the ongoing racial disturbances. And also there was pressures from the UK government. Um, there was the aliens um, registration, which made it difficult for some men actually to work in this country. Um, so they were better off returning. And surprisingly, actually, um, if you didn't get your legal status here and you was married, even though your wife was born here, she was registered as alien as well. So, you know, how shocking was that? Um, also, many young men joined the army during World War II. Um, unfortunately, there was lots of air raids that destroyed parts of Canning Town, including Crown Street, where there was a, a vast community of um, the mixed race people lived. Um, and on the 10th of September in 1940, 
there was a di direct hit on South Halesville School, which resulted in around 600 deaths of women, men and children. And many of this community was there as well. And um, Halesville School is uh, right in the, the hub of Canning Town. It's right in the middle in E16. I don't um, know if there's any... Tr Trisha, we just got... Here. Yeah, Trisha, we've got someone in the um, audience who says that, Carol says that she taught at Hallsville School for 11 years. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. It's interesting. But is there anyone else that's got any um, memories or, you know, can tell us a little bit about uh, the war and these social historians that may be online that could kind of add their comments? Okay. Yeah. Can I say something? This is Dean Armand speaking. Please do. Yeah. Please do. Uh, I, I live at West Ham, just by Memorial Park, and just across the way is the East London Cemetery, and that's got a fantastic uh, monument to all the names of the people that they could find who died in the Hallsville School bombing. Right. And the problem was, because there was a lot of bombing of the docks at the time, it was decided to evacuate the civilians. They concentrated them in a collection point at Hallsville School. And unfortunately, the buses that were supposed to have come, so it's alleged, is that they went to Camden Town, not Canning Town. So all the people, that's why there were so many oh. hundreds of people in the school. And unfortunately, it tragedy took a direct hit from a German bomb. They think over 600 people were killed. And it's tragic and heartrending when you look mm -hmm. at the, uh, the memorial in the, in the uh, cemetery, because you, you see the whole site, the same names again and again, you realise its whole family's wiped out. Yeah. Because it was thought to be bad for morale, the UK government suppressed all mention of this tragedy for a very long time. And that's why it's so difficult to get any records about it. Mm. But if any people ever watch a TV series called Foil's War, yeah. by, there's an episode in that about someone who tracks someone down intending to kill them because his family were killed in that bombing and, and he was tragically, he believed this civil servant was responsible for the failure of the evacuation. But, but the real legacy of Hallsville School is it led to the creation of the NHS because it was the first major tragedy of this kind and the government simply did not know what to do. What do you do with hundreds of people mm -hmm. injured, dead, wounded, nowhere to live, mm. don't have any medical records, don't have any identity cards and the rest of it? And it was a man called Simon Coldwell, who is the independence travel specialist. You may have seen yeah. him on TV. His father reported all of this, despite the terrible restrictions on him. And mm. it's eventually what was the seed that led to the NHS. So once again, Newham and Canning Town are right at the heart of everything. Mm, that's a really interesting story. I'd like to talk to you more about that, actually. Thanks, Dean. Um, yeah. Just a comment. In, yeah, Lucy um, brought up in chat as well the fact that that was initially covered up um, and obviously Dean's shed a bit more light on that. It's outrageous, it's very sad. What about the, um, I was thinking Peter and Mark, you presented a film, Neighbourhood 15, at the beginning of um, Heritage Month this year, which seemed to cover a similar, similar geography. How does all of that period fit in with what Patricia's been reflecting on here? Peter, do you want to comment? Shall I comment? I mean, Canning Town was extremely heavily bombed, uh, as we've talked, and then uh, was redeveloped in the post-war period. And that post-war redevelopment was covered in the film that Mark and I showed for New York Heritage Month um, 10 days ago. Just to say, um, the black community did hang on in Canning Town after World War II, but in very, very small numbers. I was the, I managed the council housing estates in Cape Town in the 1990s. And uh, there were one or two people, there was a famous character called Vera Cohen, who um, um, was a, you know, a Canning Town personality. And mm -hmm. um, her origins were in the black community uh, pre-World War II. So uh, th there were small numbers of black people in Canning Town post-war. And then the numbers increased quite dramatically in the 1980s when the housing department in Newham mm. introduced certain policies. And uh, Mark and I talked about that in, um, in our film, which I think, um, I imagine Rosie is on the um, Newham Heritage uh, website. Yeah, it's an interesting film. You can access it still through, um, through our website. Thank you, Peter. Right, I will, I will definitely check it out. Okay.
So just, I just want to summarise, and then we'd, I'll just give you, um, give you over to Hajie who can talk about um, the photography exhibition. Um, so beginning as a society of sailors and soldiers, the community grew to include entrepreneurial individuals who helped strengthen social, social and charitable organisations in Canning Town. This local community spirit continues supporting dock and factory workers and their families with many organisations formed across London. This presentation has just charted some of the lives of the individuals in Canning Town and remembers their contributions both locally and beyond. Um, so that kind of brings me towards the end of this presentation. But, and I found another image, um, and I really do love this image here as well. We're not gonna analyze it, but I just wanted to end it here. Um, again, we have sailors, on here um, from across the world. And the thing that always surprises me is how young they look. Um, you know, these are just, they look to me, some of them just look like kids to be quite honest. Um, so I just wanted to end this part of the presentation here. Is there any comments on this, this final image here? No? I love the hairstyle from the person on the left. <laughs> Oh, I was hoping someone would mention that he's got the per he's, he's on the boat he's on the ships and he's got the most yeah, perfect yeah, yeah. afro. You know. Especially where he is. <laughs> exactly. How do yeah. you cope with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Oh. Okay, and just finally, just want to talk a little bit how you can get involved in this project if you wish, if you've got an interest in photography. Um. So in the booklet that I've created, so I'll just give you here, yeah, there are lots of activities that you can try out in your own time. And if you have some images that you think are really great, you know, you can pass them on to us. Um, Hajir, did you want to um, talk a little bit about the, the photographers in this group? Uh, hi, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, some of the people that we got into to take some of these pictures are from our group, which is the I'm a photographer group, which was set up during the lockdown. We said, up so we can get the local photographers from Rosetta Art and those people who we know locally to join us and do these um, uh, challenges every week. And when this picture was taken photographed by one of our members, Chanida, who is living in Plasto at the moment. Uh, and this project is about looking at uh, your local area. And one of these pictures, uh, Trisha was asking them to photograph the buildings in the area that caught their attention. And Chanida photographed this building. And the rest of the people, they try to photograph, um, the, or to copy the version, the modern version of, of current uh, area of, of Kenning Town or uh, the, the old buildings that were features in this program, uh, like Maggie who went around kindly and photographed all the churches and the buildings that were there uh, in the mo at the moment. And really, to be honest with you, uh, Kenning Town or East Eastern was really a very historic area. It used to be the hard life of London with all the, the poor and uh, commercial activities coming from there. If you were there, you could photograph a lot of historic things, which to be honest with you, before this project, I didn't realize a Royal Dog has gone all the way through. I thought Royal Dog is just near Royal, uh, Royal Victoria Dog. So if you wanna take part in this project, you have two ways of doing it. You could either photograph uh, your family members uh, using the same style of photography. So if you're doing portraiture, or you could make five images making a summary of your own family. So this project, this uh, images could photograph maybe uh, a color that reminds you a member of a family, uh, an item, a jewelry that belongs to an aunt or an uncle. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be a portrait. It could be anything that summarizes in your own mind. This is my memory of my own family. So if you could do that and make it into a collage like it's been shown here by Trisha, you could uh, submit that to Trisha and that will go into our own exhibition that is going to be online uh, soon after this. Any other question? If anybody has a question about the project and, and how we're going to be uh, doing it, you can ask me and, and Trisha. Yeah.
at any time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Hajia. So, um, yeah, so we just charted some, you know, uh, a, a little piece of history. And if you feel inspired, if you want to submit some images, you want to get involved in a project, because um, I, I think this is something that I would love to continue. Um, please submit some images or ask questions. My email address is hello at trishadion.co.uk. Um, and we can showcase them on the Humble Gallery and the Newham Heritage website. Um, and that was it really, it kind of brings me to the close of the event. There's a lot more free events at Newham Heritage. Go and check them out. And I'm happy to answer any questions, but uh, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. <laughs>